Hi friends, welcome back. I am going to finish Stuart Little tonight. I can't believe it. It's been quite the journey with this book with you guys. So when we last left off, I kept you on a cliffhanger. We stopped in the middle of a chapter. Stuart had gotten um, Miss Ames, Miss Harriet Ames, who is his size, to come down to the river with him. And he had hoped to take her on the canoe. But when he was doing that, the canoe has disappeared. So we're going to see what happens. I'm going to read back a little bit too, just from where we were. Stuart led the way to where he had hidden the canoe and Harriet followed. But when they reached the spot, Stuart was horrified to discover that the canoe was not there. It had disappeared. Stuart's heart sank. He felt like crying. The canoe was gone, he groaned. Then he began racing wildly up and down the bank, looking everywhere. Harriet joined in the search and after a while they found the canoe but it was a mess. Someone had been playing with it. A long piece of heavy string was tied to one end. The ballast rocks were gone. The pillow was gone. The backrest was gone. The spruce gum had come out of the seam. Mud was all over everything, and one of the paddles was all bent and twisted. It was just a mess. It looked like the way a birch bark canoe looks after some big boys are finished playing with it. Stuart was heartbroken. He did not know what to do. He sat down on a twig and buried his head in his hands. Oh, gee, he kept saying. Oh, gee whiz. What's the trouble, asked Harriet. Miss Ames, said Stuart in a trembling voice. I assure you, I had everything beautifully arranged. Everything. And now look. Harriet was for fixing the canoe up and going out on the river anyway, but Stuart couldn't stand the idea. It's no use, he said bitterly. It wouldn't be the same. The same as what, asked Harriet. The same as the way it was going to be when I was thinking about it yesterday. Look at that string. It's tied on so tight I could never get it off. Well, suggested Harriet, couldn't we just let it hang over in the water and trail along after us? Stuart looked at her in despair. We can't do that. We could pretend we're fishing, said Harriet, who didn't realize that some people are fussy about boats. I don't want to pretend I'm fishing, cried Stuart desperately. Besides, look at that mud. Look at it. He was screaming now. Harriet sat down on a twig beside Stuart. She offered him a peppermint, but he shook his head. Well, she said, it's starting to rain, and I guess I'd better be running along if you're not going to take me paddling in your canoe. I don't see why you have to sit here and sulk. Would you like to come up to my house? After dinner, you could take me to the dance at the country club. Might cheer you up. No, thank you, replied Stuart. I don't know how to dance. Besides, I plan to make an early start in the morning. I'll probably be on the road at daybreak. Are you going to sleep out in all this rain, asked Harriet? Certainly, said Stuart. I'll crawl in under the canoe. Harriet shrugged her shoulders. Well, she said, goodbye, Mr. Little. Goodbye, Miss Ames, said Stuart. I'm sorry our evening on the river had to end like this. So am I, said Harriet. And she walked away along the wet path toward Tracy's lane, leaving Stuart alone with his broken dreams and his damaged canoe. Stuart has having a really hard time with that. I don't know that he was making the best choices. So now we're on chapter 15, heading north. Stuart slept under the canoe that night. He wakened at four to find that the rain had stopped. The day would break clear. Already the birds were beginning to stir and make bright sounds in the branches overhead. Stuart never let a bird pass without looking to see if it was Margolo. At the edge of the town, he found a filling station and stopped to take on some gas. Five, please, said Stuart to the attendant. The man looked at the tiny automobile in amazement. Five what, he asked. Five drops, said Stuart, but the man shook his head and said he couldn't sell such a small amount of gas. Why can't you, demanded Stuart. You need the money and I need the gas. Why can't we work something out between us? The filling station man went inside and came back with a medicine dropper. Stuart unscrewed the cap of the tank and the man put in five drops of gasoline. I've never done anything like this before, he said. Better look at the oil too, said Stuart. After everything had been checked and the money had been paid, Stuart climbed in, started the engine and drove out onto the highway. The sky was growing brighter and along the river the mists of morning hung in the early light. The village was still asleep. Stuart's car purred along smoothly. Stuart felt refreshed and glad to be on the move again. Half a mile out of town, the road forked. One road seemed to go off toward the west. The other road continued north. 
Stuart drew up to look drew up to the side of a northbound road and got out to look the situation over. To his surprise, he discovered that there was a man sitting in the ditch, leaning against a signpost. The man wore spurs on his legs. He also wore a heavy leather belt, and Stuart realized that he must be a repairman for the telephone company. Good morning, said Stuart in a friendly voice. The repairman raised one hand to his head in salute. Stuart sat down in the ditch beside him and breathed deeply of the fresh, sweet air. It's going to be a fine day, he observed. Yes, agreed the repairman, a fine day. I'm looking forward to climbing my poles. I wish you fair skies and a tight grip, said Stuart. By the way, do you ever see any birds at the tops of your poles? Yes, I see birds in great numbers, replied the repairman. Well, if you ever run across a bird named Margalo, said Stuart, I'd appreciate it if you would drop me a line. Here's my card. Describe the bird, said the repairman, taking out pad and pencil. Brown, said Stuart. Brown with a streak of yellow on her bosom. Know where she comes from, asked the man. She comes from fields once tall with wheat, from pastures deep in fern and thistle. She comes from vales of meadow sweet, and she loves to whistle. The repairman wrote it all down. Fields, wheat, pastures, fern and thistle. Vales, meadow sweet, enjoys whistling. Then he put the pad back in his pocket and tucked Stuart's card away in his wallet. I'll keep my eyes open, he promised. Stuart thanked him. They sat for a while in silence. Then the man spoke. Which direction are you headed, he asked. North, said Stuart. North is nice, said the repairman. I've always enjoyed going north. Of course, southwest is a fine direction, too. Yes, I suppose it is, said Stuart thoughtfully. And there's east, continued the repairman. I once had an interest experiencing out on an easterly course. Do you want me to tell you about it? No, thanks, said Stuart. The repairman seemed disappointed, but he kept right on talking. There's something about north, he said, something that sets it apart from all other directions. A person who's heading north is not making any mistake, in my opinion. That's the way I look at it, said Stuart. I'd rather expect that from now on I shall be traveling north until the end of my days. Worse things than that could happen to a person, said the repairman. Yes, I know, answered Stuart. Following a broken telephone line north, I've come upon some wonderful places, continued the repairman. Swamps where cedars grow and turtles wait on logs, but not for anything in particular. Fields bordered by crooked fences, broken by years of standing still. Orchards so old they've forgotten where the farmhouse is. In the north, I've eaten my lunch in pastures rank with ferns and junipers, all under fair skies with a blowing wind. My business has taken me into spruce woods on winter nights, where the snow lay deep and soft, a perfect place for a carnival of rabbits. I have sat at peace on the freight platforms of railroad junctions in the north, in the warm hours, and with the warm smells. I know fresh lakes in the north, undisturbed except by fish and hawk, and of course by the telephone company, which has to follow its nose. I know all these places well. They're a long way from here. Don't forget that. And a person who is looking for something doesn't travel very fast. That's perfectly true, said Stuart. Well, I guess I better be going. Thank you for your friendly remarks. Not at all, said the repairman. I hope you find that bird. Stuart rose from the ditch, climbed into his car, and started up the road that led toward the north. The sun was just coming up over the hills on the right. As he peered ahead into the great land that stretched before him, the way seemed long. But the sky was bright, and he somehow felt he was headed in the right direction. And if you can believe it, friends, that's where the book ends. So we never know whether or not Stuart meets Margalo again. We don't know if he ever goes home again. It, the whole book really ends on a cliffhanger. But one of the reasons why I do love this story so much is because it leaves it open to the imagination. And if you wanted to, you could continue writing this story yourself. If you wanted to, you could tell the story of whether Stuart meets up with Margalo again and goes home. Or maybe he continues on a completely different adventure that you've created. So... I know some of you are going to be disappointed that we don't have any resolutions to some of those problems that Stuart ran into, but I know that many of you will be able to use your imaginations to find an ending to this story. So I've really enjoyed reading this to you guys. I miss you all terribly, but when we get back from spring break, we'll have another read aloud planned for you. So until then, I hope to see you soon. Bye.